the important message here is that the simplest way of measuring this, in my opinion, is actually the best. And if you're thoughtful about the other metrics that you combine this with in your management system, it can be a really effective tool for understanding why your profitability is or isn't going up. Welcome to the Agency Profit Podcast, a show dedicated to going deep space on agency operations, which is just as nerdy as it sounds. I'm your host, Marcel Petipoff. I'm the CEO of Parakeeto, a firm that helps digital and creative agencies measure and improve their profitability. Join me as I interview some of the smartest thought leaders and agency owners in our space and go deep into operations, metrics, and all the other things you need to get right so you can spend less time worrying about operations and more time executing on your vision. Hello, and welcome back to the Agency Profit Podcast. Today, we have, I guess I'll call it a special episode because it's just going to be me. We're doing another solo cast episode, and we're going to be talking about something that is long overdue to be discussed in depth on the show. We're talking about the most misused, misunderstood, and potentially dangerous to your agency metric, and that is utilization, utilization rates. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about where utilization comes from, what it is, what it's meant to measure, what it's not meant to measure, how we measure it, all of the details, the reasons that it goes wrong, how it can be miscalculated and misused, how it can be properly utilized in the agency. We'll talk about benchmarks, everything that you need to know about utilization I'm going to try to cover in today's episode. So buckle up. It's going to be a good one. All right, so let's start with what utilization is and really where it comes from. Uh, utilization has been around for As long as humans have been leveraging labor to get things done, and it's also a common thing in the manufacturing space as well. Essentially, what we're trying to understand is how much of the available capacity that we have either from a person or from a machine or anything in between is being utilized for earning revenue. And earning revenue is the key distinction here in our definition, because it's not to be confused with productivity. We'll talk more about that later. And this really became an important metric in the agency industry in the billable hour era, which was the majority of the agency industry up until the last couple of decades. And so most of us that are familiar with utilization rates probably experienced them for the first time working in an environment like that, where oftentimes it was used as a performance metric, which In a pure time and materials environment, there is potentially an argument for doing that because in that world, the more time the team works, the more the clients will be billed, the more revenue that the agency makes. So there is a much closer linkage between time worked and revenue. But in a modern agency, in a modern context, most of the time, that's not really the case. Even in a time materials shop, there's often going to be limits to how much time you can invest in a client or into a project before you start to not get paid for that time. And in particular, where we're starting to decouple the billing model from the time spent on the client, looking at flat rates, value-based, flat retainers, et cetera, then the utility of utilization as a performance metric for the team starts to decrease and its usefulness becomes a little bit more abstracted from the individual contributor level because there isn't such a clear link between how many hours we work and how much money we make as a business. And so in that new context, the definition of utilization and how we use it, we we need to be much more thoughtful about it because it's not as simple as it once was if you're in an environment where time equaled money and that link was very strong. And I would argue that even in that case, again, because there was hour slippage, it really wasn't that easy. And so in a more And so now we get into the challenges with utilization that a lot of people face. The first big one is that it's actually quite simple on the surface, right? What is the formula for utilization? We'll talk more about this, but essentially it's how many delivery hours or in a lot of firms, this will be defined as a billable hour were worked and what was the capacity against that. And that measurement could be looked at for the entire agency. It could be looked at for an individual and everything in between. But of course, the nuance comes down to how you define each of those things. What exactly is a billable hour? Does it matter if the client was billed for it or does it only matter 
if it's time that was spent on the client? And does working on the company website count as a billable hour? And what about these internal meetings where we're talking about a whole bunch of different clients? So there's a lot of detail in terms of what does or doesn't qualify as a billable hour that can have a very material impact on the measure of utilization. And the same thing is true for capacity. What exactly is our capacity within the context of measuring utilization? And does it include things like time off or not? And what about holidays? And what about sick days? And who is included in that calculation? Are we looking at the whole team? Or are we just looking at a certain segment of the team? For example, the billable team. And what about somebody that's partially on the billable team, but partially does administrative work? How would we allocate their capacity to this formula? The, the devils are in the details here. And therein lies one of the biggest challenges with utilization is that there are hundreds of variations on how to calculate this because of the variations that exist at how we define the objects within the calculation. And this is what makes it so incredibly difficult to benchmark utilization from one firm to another, and why so many of the industry reports that we get are, I, I believe, very problematic because they often don't do a very good job of trying to control for these variables. And even when they do try to control for these variables, there's only so much they can do about really validating the data that's coming in. For example, if we had a time tracking company that was trying to publish some benchmarking data around uh, utilization, they have no control over how the object of a billable hour is being used inside of their software. And so you might have a firm where they're counting things like working on the company website as billable, and you have another firm that's not. And it's very hard to control for those kind of variations at scale without really bringing that data through uh, a cleaning process that's high context and that's very deliberate. And so this is another one of the challenges is benchmarking and understanding what is a good utilization rate, what's a bad utilization rate becomes really challenging. And I'll make the argument that what other people are doing is not nearly as important as what's necessary for your firm to be profitable and what makes sense for your culture. There isn't, in my opinion, really a benchmark for utilization. I've seen firms be profitable with 25% utilization rates because they found ways to compensate for that low utilization rate. And I've seen firms with 80% utilization rates be not profitable. And so it's not the only variable. And it's part of it's part of a trifecta of variables that really determine the fate of the agency. So I'm going to explain now how we calculate and define these things within the Paracuto framework. And before I get into that, I want to make it clear that what I'm about to share is how we do it. And it doesn't necessarily mean that this is the right way to do it. But it is the right way within our context, meaning when we think about how utilization plugs into a larger framework that is connected to financial metrics, capacity metrics, efficiency metrics, if we think about how we approach measuring an agency across finance, sales and marketing and operations, the way in which we calculate utilization is consistent with all the other metrics, which means if there's a change in utilization, we know exactly, mathematically, how it impacts all the other things in that system. And so we made all of the decisions at this level of how we measure utilization in the context of how it fits into a broader system. And that, to me, is the important part. If you want to calculate utilization differently and you found a way of calculating it differently that works for you, that's great as long as it's consistent with everything else that you measure. And that is not a simple thing to figure out. And most people have not figured this out. Or they figured out a way to do it that works for their business in this context. But then the moment they introduce a new pricing model or they change something, they have to rethink the entire system. And so this is part of the reason that I would encourage you to consider adopting our framework, because the way that we've designed it is meant to be flexible and it can handle changes in pricing models and billing models in team staffing, whether you use freelancers or in-house or outsourced staff. So it's abstracted and it has worked for dozens of firms across all kinds of different business models, across all kinds of different industries. And what's nice about that is it handles change very well. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you change your business model. So I want to make that clear because I think it's important context before we get into this, that this isn't necessarily the right way to do it, but it's the way that we do it. And the reason we do it this way is because it makes sense in the broader context of things. And I'll try to explain the justification for some of the things that might seem counterintuitive about how we approach utilization in our context. Let's do a little screen share. If you're listening to this on audio, there'll be a YouTube version of this that you'll be able to watch for some visuals, but I'll try to talk through it as I go. And so the first thing I want to do is I want to make it clear that 
utilization is one of three major levers that affect delivery margin. What delivery margin really is meant to capture is how profitable is every dollar of client revenue at the point in which we've delivered on that outcome. So to put that into a context, if a client gives us $10,000 to build them a website, how much of that money is left over after the website has been delivered, but before we pay to run the business, we pay for overhead and facilities and the rest of those expenses. So we're just looking at the fundamental profitability of the work itself. And there are three ways that we can improve that fundamental profitability, which really sets the foundation for the firm's profitability as a whole. The first is average cost per hour, which is meant to essentially lower the delivery cost. So the lower the cost for every hour that's spent on doing that work in aggregate, the lower the cost of staffing our delivery team will be. The second is average billable rate. So this looks at for every hour that we spend doing work for a given area of the business, on average, how much revenue does that earn for us? And then the last one is utilization. That's the last big lever, and it's a really important one. And utilization asks the question of how much of the capacity that we buy from our team in bulk is being utilized to earn this average billable rate, right? So do we spend 20% of the time that we buy from the team making money or do we spend 50 or do we spend 80? And of course, the more time that we buy from our team is being deployed against earning revenue for the business, the more efficient that business is at leveraging capacity into revenue. And therefore, the less pressure there is on having a very high average billable rate or even having a very low average cost per hour. So all of these things are interrelated. If we lift one, we can either lower the others or we can leave them all the same or increase them. And, and these levers impact profitability. We'll go through an example of that later on. So I share this so that you can keep in mind that, again, this is just one piece of the puzzle. And if you have, for some reason, a constraint, that means that your utilization needs to be very low or perhaps you're just choosing to have a lower utilization because you value lifestyle more than absolute profitability or you just want to really create a great environment for your team. Not a problem necessarily. You can compensate for that either by lowering your average cost per hour and or by increasing your average bill rate and you can still end up in the right place in terms of profitability and financial outcomes. So let's talk about the formula for utilization. The formula is quite simple. It is defined as delivery hours over capacity. Now, let's talk about the specific definitions of each of these things. First of all, delivery hours. What is a delivery hour? And why don't I just call it a billable hour? And the reason I don't call it a billable hour is because the word billable could become problematic in the sense that it infers that it matters whether or not a client was billed for the time. And of course, today, most firms don't exclusively bill on time materials. In fact, most some of them don't bill on time materials at all. All of their pricing is going to be based on flat fees, are going to be based on value. And so there isn't a concept really of a billable hour in that case. And so we don't really care if the client was billed for the time. We care about how much time it took to get the work done, to earn revenue in that case. And even in the case of a time materials shop, a lot of the time, we're not going to bill the client for all the hours that we worked because there's going to be mistakes or there's going to be overruns or perhaps we had an intern working on this that took longer and so we're not going to bill through all of the hours. And let's go through an example of how this would affect things. And by the way, this is important not just for utilization. It's also important for how we would measure average billable rate. So let's go through an example of that just to kind of illustrate the point. So let's say, for example, we have a project and on that project, the AGI, the agency gross income that we collect is $10,000. So after stripping out any pass-through expenses, we got paid $10,000 to do this work. And so the billable hours on this project were 100 hours. So we billed the client for $100 per hour, but the delivery hours on the project, so how many hours we actually worked on the project was 125. And let's just say we had during that time capacity of 200 hours. Okay. So in this example, our utilization rate, if we used billable hours would be 100 over 200, which would be 50%. So this is billable utilization. But if we looked at delivery utilization, we would have 125 hours over 200. And so you can see here that the utilization rate is higher in the other case, 62.5%. And where you would 
see the problem with this or where somebody would say that this is a problem that they would say, okay, but you know, if we measure this using delivery hours, then we're going to think that we're more profitable than we actually are because our utilization rate looks like it's 62%, but we actually only got paid for 50% of the time that we worked on that. And again, we got to think about the broader system. That's not a problem because in the Parakeeto system, we would capture this in average billable rate. So when we measure average billable rate over here, if we did this based on billable hours, then we would say, okay, $10,000 in AGI divided by 100 billable hours would be $100 per hour. So in this case, it looks like, okay, we made $100 per hour. If we did this based on delivery hours, it would be 125 hours that we're dividing our agency gross income by. And so if we divide 10,000 by 125, we end up with an $80 average billable rate. So we should see the, de the decrease in profitability here. And so it doesn't matter that our utilization rate looks higher. As long as we're looking at these things together, which we always should be, then these things balance each other out. But this to me is important because this is a reflection of how busy the team actually was. And when we exclusively focus on billable utilization, the insight that we often get is, yes, we're only getting paid for 50% of our time. That's great. That's better than no insight. But what we start to do in this case is we tend to try and push utilization rate up. And if we're not looking at this in conjunction with average billable rate, you can see here that it's not clear to us what the actual problem was. If we define this based on billable hours, what it looks like is that we were on budget and we were efficient at earning the revenue, but it was that our team wasn't busy enough. But the opposite is actually true. The team was busy, but we didn't earn the revenue efficiently. And so you could see here that the inference, what this metric tells us changes based on how we define a billable hour versus how we define a delivery hour. And to me, this detail is really important because the way we react to this would probably be very different if we where in this scenario, we thought our utilization was low, but our project was on budget, we would give our team more work to do. And the reality is they're a lot busier than it looks. And so probably what we end up here is a lot of evenings and weekends and overtime and our team starts to subsidize our work. We probably run into issues attracting and retaining talent. We probably run into issues with burnout. We probably run into issues with quality. And the reality is that what actually happened was we spent more time than we expected on this project. And so this would be addressed differently. We might charge more next time. We might estimate differently. We might look for opportunities to get this process more efficient so that we can actually get to the level of efficiency that we want. And what that helps us do is actually scale the business in a more sustainable way. And we don't have this false idea of how long it's actually taking to do things and we lower the risk of overworking our team. So to me, this is why the definition of a billable hour versus a delivery hour is a really important thing to create separation around. So that kind of covers the definition of a delivery hour. And a delivery hour, simply put, is any time that we spend doing client work, regardless of whether or not it impacts how much we get paid. If it was necessary to get things done, it needs to be included in delivery hours. And we can look at this for any section of the business. We can look at it for a project, for a group of projects, for clients, and we can look at it for any time period, a week, a month, a quarter. So this scales both horizontally and vertically. And then the same thing is true about capacity. So the capacity metric, I want to give a warning to anyone that's a project manager listening to this. You're probably going to have an aneurysm when I first explain how we measure capacity, but bear with me. I'll explain to you why I think this makes more sense than doing it in the way that you might naturally gravitate towards. When we talk about capacity, we're talking about all of the time that we purchase from a given team for the area of the business that we're measuring. So if we looked at utilization for the whole agency for a year, for example, we would include everybody in that calculation, including the admin staff, including the sales staff, including the founder, people that don't do any client work or people that only do a little bit. We're including all of their capacity in this calculation if we're looking at the whole business and we're including everything. So we're not going to strip out time off. We're not going to strip out holidays. We're not going to strip out non-billable work. So for most people, 40 hours a week for 52 weeks a year, their capacity is 2,080 hours per year. And I know what you're thinking, but Marcel, that's not their capacity. They don't work 2,080 hours a year. We have to give them vacation. We have to give them paid time off. Many of them are not productive. Isn't that going to make our utilization rate look lower? And the answer is yes. 
it is and it should because your utilization is lower and it is lower because of all of those things and the impact of not including those things is a really dangerous false positive so let's talk through an example of this once again let's say that we have an individual they have 2080 hours of capacity in our model and they work 1400 delivery hours in a year so in this example their utilization rate 1400 divided by 2080 is 67.3 percent all right so this was their utilization rate in our calculation now let's imagine that instead of calculating their capacity as 2080 hours we have the same number of delivery hours but we're going to subtract out let's call it four weeks of time off and holidays and sick days and those kinds of things so four by 40 is 160 we're going to subtract that so that gives us 1920 hours of capacity instead All right so we're adjusting their capacity down to 1920. so now if we take that 1400 and we divide it by 1920 now their utilization looks like it's 72.9 percent and so you think well that, that seems more fair doesn't it but the reality is this is going to make it look like our utilization rate is five percent higher than it actually is we're not seeing the cost of all of that time off in here and what this does is it creates this incentive and this effect where the more time off I strip out of this the higher my utilization rate goes so I get this false positive which is telling me the more time off the more non-billable work the more capacity I strip out from my model in my business the more profitable the agency becomes and that's actually the opposite of what's really going on now why does this happen I think this is really important the reason this happens most often from my experience is that utilization rate is exposed to individual contributors on the team so the designers and developers and copywriters that come in every day to do client work are starting to be held accountable to utilization rates which I think is a mistake because the impact that has is they start to focus on hitting that utilization rate instead of being efficient on projects they start to complain about things that seem really unfair hey well you asked me to work on the company website and therefore my utilization rate was lower and so I feel like I'm being penalized for doing what I was told and then we to appease that sentiment will say oh yeah that, that does seem a little unfair let's change the definition of working on uh, the company website to be a billable hour which now again is going to inflate our sense of what our utilization rate actually is and similarly hey I took vacation I took time off but now my utilization rate looks low that doesn't seem fair to me and so we say yes okay let's appease your sentiment and let's change the definition of capacity to strip those things out and so this is to me not a reflection of a flaw in the metric because the metrics job is to tell us if we are efficiently using the capacity for client work what this challenge is is a reflection of the metric not being used in the right way and the purpose of the metric not being understood and from my perspective this isn't really something that we need to be exposing to individual contributors especially in an environment where we're billing on flat rates or we're billing on value because all that's going to do is create negative incentives and they ultimately don't really have much or any control over this metric they don't get to choose how much staff we hire and they don't get to choose how much work we sell and how we resource them against that work so this metric really is a management metric right utilization is really within the management team's control and if we want to get a sense of how productive the team is or how effectively we're resource planning we can use alternative forms of utilization but those are different and they serve different purposes so the idea of how much how well did we use what was available to us this week is a very different question than how utilized was the agency this week those should be calculated differently so this is the case that I'm making for why this is a better way to do it it has a bunch of added benefits of being more accurate actually for the question that we're trying to answer here but it also is less expensive we don't need to make all of these micro adjustments for things like time off and holidays and sick time we also don't have this now idiosyncratic measurement from one time period to another and so it's actually a lot easier to compare utilization this month to last month because we're not going to have the basis of capacity shifting all over the place or shifting over time and for all of those reasons we really believe in this way of calculating utilization we find that it is a more truthful reflection it is more mathematically consistent when you zoom that out and start to connect it to things like average billable rate 
average cost per hour and ultimately to delivery margin. And that to me is the right way to use it. Hey, it's Marcel here, and I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. If you are, then I want to encourage you to check out the Agency Profitability Toolkit. It's a free set of resources that we've put together to help agency owners just like you improve their profitability. It's full of free checklists, templates, and training videos, and has helped thousands of agencies get better at measuring the essentials of their business. So if you want to grab a free copy of that, you can head to paraquito.com forward slash toolkit or look for a link wherever you're watching or listening to this. With that, I want to thank you again for tuning in, and I'll let you get back to the episode. Let's talk now about the benchmarks for this metric. And really, there aren't benchmarks, like I mentioned before. But typically, what we see, I'll show you what is typical. And typical means if you're going to charge a typical amount, and you're going to pay people a typical amount, and you still want to be profitable, uh, these are the kinds of targets that you would want to be setting. And so on a weekly basis, your pre producers would be somewhere in the 75% plus range. So we're talking about 28 to 30 hours of billable time out of their 40 hour week. For delivery managers, there's going to be a very wide range on this because the, the, the way that those roles are defined is very broad. And the ability for them to actually track their time can be fairly broad. For example, a project manager that's overseeing 200 clients at a time it's going to be very hard for them to actually effectively track their delivery time. And so a lot of this is going to be considered delivery overhead. But in their case, really anything over 35% is pretty good. But we'll see a very, very wide range here. And then for anybody else, like the founders, the sales and marketing people, administrative staff, anything above zero is really a bonus. And what matters more than anything is that the composition of the agency sets a floor that is or sets a ceiling, I should say, that is high enough to give the agency a chance of being profitable. And generally speaking, on a weekly basis, we're aiming for 65% plus. So on an annual basis, we need to now consider, like I said before, the cost of time off, holidays, etc. how much that's going to lower our utilization as a business. So again, it's not that we're ignoring these costs, it's that we are actually factoring them in a way that makes sense for the rest of the system. So in this case, we're generally going to lose anywhere from 10 to 20% of our utilization throughout the year for time off and holidays and things of that nature, sick time. Most firms fall right in that range, 10 to 20%. So if you want to be conservative, take 20% off. I'm using 15 for this example. So pure producers end up at around 60% on an annual basis, delivery managers at 20% plus, everyone else at 0% plus. And like I said, if you're in a typical situation, if you can achieve a utilization rate of 50% or higher, you're putting yourself in position to be profitable as long as your rates aren't materially lower than every, everyone else, or you're not paying significantly more than everyone else for your talent. Again, I'm not really big on benchmarks for utilization rates, but hopefully this is helpful to give you a sense. Now, I want to illustrate the impact that this has on an agency's profitability. So let's imagine that we have 10,000 hours of capacity, so roughly a team of five people, and we have a utilization rate of 50% in the first example and a utilization rate of 60% in the second example. And across both of these, we have an average billable rate of $100 per hour. Then the amount of agency gross income or agency revenue that this business can bring in changes in these two scenarios. At a 50% utilization rate, that means we have 5,000 hours earning revenue at a, an average of $100 per hour. This firm can make a half a million dollars in AGI. This next firm at 60% now is 6,000 hours being used in that way. And so that brings this up to $600,000. And so you can see that this utilization rate has a really material impact on the financial outcome. Now, the other thing that we can look at is, let's say a firm wants to get to $600,000, but for some reason, they can't raise their utilization rate. Perhaps that's just culturally something that they're not willing to do, or they have some constraints in terms of how their team is composed. Then in this case, we could use the lever of average bubble rate to still get to that level. And so in this case, we would take $600,000 and we would divide it by the 5,000 hours they have available. And what we would see is that, well, we can earn the right to maintain this lower utilization rate and still achieve that $600,000 outcome by having a higher average billable rate. So this, I hope, illustrates the relationship between these two metrics and helps, again, illustrate why utilization shouldn't be and doesn't have to be 
the only metric that we use to try and gauge the efficiency of our team. And if we pair this with something like an average billable rate, we can have a more simple and truthful measurement of that metric and still be able to see the full picture of how to achieve a certain outcome or why we're achieving a certain outcome and what's really causing us to increase or decrease our profitability as a firm. Next thing I want to talk about is how do we improve utilization? And so I want to remind you of the formula, right? We have delivery hours over capacity. And so really there are two levers to improve our utilization. We can either increase the number of delivery hours or we can decrease our capacity. So in this case, where we have a certain amount of capacity and we have a certain amount of delivery hours and we're looking ahead at the next month and we're seeing here that we're going to miss our target. We have a gap. There are two levers that we can pull. We can decrease our capacity, which is corporate speak for we lay people off. We actually decrease the amount of people that we have on the team or we can sell more work and sell more work is the key sentence here. It's not enough to just tell our team, hey, work more hours, because if we recall the formula for average billable rate, then we're not going to see a benefit from that if we're earning the same amount of revenue. The only way in which working more hours improves our profitability is that we are actually getting paid for that time. So we either go sell more projects, which increases the amount of work that our team can do that earns additional revenue, or for in a time and materials environment, we are able to work more hours that can be billed through to the client. But this idea of selling more work is really critical because the mistake I see people make is their utilization rate gets low. They go to their team. They say, hey, I need you working more hours. The team works more hours, earning the same amount of revenue they were before. And now we actually just have a worse situation. We have a team that is busier than they need to be. They have a false understanding of what the scope of work is. We have clients that are used to getting over service and we have an efficiency problem. And so now getting back to profitability takes two steps. We have to first fix this efficiency problem that we've created by doing this. And then we have to increase our utilization. And so I really, really want to drive that point home that this is one of the reasons why I really don't believe in exposing utilization to the team directly, unless it's being done very thoughtfully, because doing so without enough context creates this kind of problem. And it either gets your team spending more time doing things than is necessary to try and arbitrarily meet this target, or they're lying on their timesheets, which really hurts your ability to see what's going on. So let's talk about tactics to improve utilization rates. What are some practical ways that you can do this? One of the big ones is what I call client dilution. And really what this speaks to is that generally speaking, teams that spread across fewer clients at a time or fewer projects at a time tend to have higher utilization rates without burning out. And this kind of is intuitive if you think about it. If I'm a software developer and I get to work on the same project every day for six months at a time, and I don't really have to go to many internal meetings. I don't really have to think a whole lot about other things that are going on. I know what I'm working on. I have clear direction. I can just log in and work on the project every day. Then I might be able to work 32, 34, 36, 38 billable hours a week and not be that stressed out because my focus is on one thing. Whereas if I'm a project manager and I'm spread across 25 different clients at a time, my utilization rate might only be 40 or 50% and I feel very stressed out. And it's probably necessary for me to spend a lot more time in things that are not billable because, because there's such a drag and a cost to managing multiple clients. And likely there's a lot of cost to context switching and task switching that I have to deal with. And so generally speaking, as a rule of thumb, if you can lower client dilution, meaning your team has to worry about fewer projects at one time, and you can do larger allocations of people and their focus to fewer clients, you can increase the amount of utilization that you get from that team without actually making them feel more stressed. And that really is the important consideration there. The second big thing is investing in forecasting because so much of this is about as an executive leadership team, as a project management team, being able to balance staffing to work coming in and not being overstaffed too often, not making full-time hires when you really should have used freelancers not uh, hiring the wrong person with the wrong skill set. So part of your team still feels really busy and overworked while another part of your team has too much free time on their hands. And so hiring the right people at the right time and balancing that against your pipeline is such an important piece to getting this right. And in particular around forecasting, the important consideration here is trying to separate 
bottom up forecasting from top down forecasting. And the mistake I see a lot of firms make here is they only have a bottom up forecasting system, which means they take projects or work, they break it down into tasks and they assign those tasks to individuals. And that's a great way to get an understanding of who's doing what for the next week or two weeks and really looking at a granular and precise level of individual contributors and the things that they're working on. But when you're trying to answer the question of what does our marketing department look like for the next three months and how does that change if we do or don't close these three projects, running that simulation in a bottom-up framework is going to have so much drag. It's going to be so slow. It's really hard to look at broad time horizons and start really looking out into the future. And that's where a top-down methodology becomes really important. So in the show notes, I'll leave a link to an article that talks more about this, but this is really our focus at Parakeeto is we, we tend to help with installing a top-down system so that the executive leadership level can look across longer time horizons and run simulations. And that's really about trying to make decisions about hiring out into the future, about what kind of clients or projects we're going to pursue from a sales and marketing perspective and is going to be much more effective at running those scenarios than a bottom-up methodology, which is really much more for a project management function, looking at short time horizons and making sure that individual contributors are properly resourced. So invest in resource forecasting and the better job you can do of keeping your staff levels appropriate to the work that's coming in and generally erring towards the side of being understaffed as opposed to being overstaffed and turning away work if you have to, this will really help you keep your utilization rates where you want them to be. The next is paying attention towards load balancing within teams. And this is a really big insight is when you have the ability to measure utilization for the whole agency, for example, but you don't really have the ability to measure it more granularly. And what we find is in a lot of cases within a department, you're going to have a couple of people that are really putting in the extra hours, that are super utilized, that are really busy, often overworked. And at the same time, there's people within that team that are underutilized. And so you might have a team where you're like, hmm, it's weird. You know, these people are telling me that they're absolutely slammed. When I look at the utilization report, it doesn't seem like it's that high. And it's when you double click that you realize, oh, it's because <laughs> they're doing half of somebody else's job. It's incredible how often we see this at Parakeeto when we double click into utilization reports and realize that there's one individual on this team that's carrying things. And you might inherently have a sense that that's happening, but when you see the data, it can really help you identify challenges where perhaps they're not doing an effective job of delegating, or perhaps they're picking up slack for a skill gap, or perhaps the person that's working on that team that's not that utilized just isn't a good fit. But getting that insight is really important because if we're not doing a good job of load balancing and spreading the workout and keeping everybody on the team utilized, that's going to ladder up to gaps in utilization and interpersonal or burnout issues among the team as well. And then the last thing to talk about is really dependencies and synchronicity. Dependencies and synchronicity. And so this is really about the mechanics of how projects take place. And this is really about, is there a handoff that needs to happen between one department or another? Or is there a task that can't be started until another one is complete, right? So project manager listening to this, this is all going to be very familiar to you, but you really want to pay attention to what is the process that needs to take place on a project and where are the places where we might get blocked and somebody is no longer able to contribute meaningful hours to this project until this thing is unblocked. And most of the time, this comes down to dependencies and handoffs within the project and synchronous meetings, where the only way to move this forward is to schedule a meeting and to get work done in that meeting. And the more stakeholders are required on that meeting, the more complex and difficult sometimes it becomes to get that scheduled. And this is where you can have a project that really could get done in a week, but it has to get spread out over three because you got to schedule these meetings and that's a consideration or you have to create enough space for these handoffs to happen. And so trying to minimize the amount of that kind of stuff that occurs within a project or find ways to de-risk those things can be a really big lever in helping you actually fill in utilization as much as possible and minimize the cost or loss that occurs when things don't go as planned, when somebody is late on a deliverable, when a meeting needs to get rescheduled, and it creates this vacuum now where you have to find ways to fill that time. You have to now context switch and move on to another project because this one's now blocked and those things can get really expensive if they get out of hand. So those are some of the highest uh, leverage places to focus is on trying to decrease client dilution, 
trying to invest in forecasting so you can balance your capacity to your work, trying to really focus on load balancing within teams and making sure that work is getting spread out between individuals, and then looking at the way that projects actually happen and decrease the risk of dependencies and synchronicity on creating unused time because somebody is actually blocked from being able to contribute to the work that they need to do. So to recap what we've talked about in today's episode, number one, utilization is a really important metric, but it's also very misunderstood. It's very easy to get confused and get into the weeds around capacity and billable hours and how to define those things and how to set targets around this. But the important message here is that the simplest way of measuring this, in my opinion, is actually the best. And if you're thoughtful about the other metrics that you combine this with in your management system, it can be a really effective tool for understanding why your profitability is or isn't going up. And what you want to really make sure you do, however you're deciding to measure utilization, is consider the impact that it has on the rest of your management framework. Be clear about the purpose of this metric. Is it meant to measure the efficiency of the agency? Or are you trying to answer a completely different question? Like how good are we at resource planning? Or how productive is the team in a given week? Those are different questions than how efficiently do we deploy our capacity against earning revenue? And just try to avoid exposing this to the team without being really thoughtful, because it's very easy to underestimate the damage that can do in your business. So with all of that, I hope that you have enjoyed this episode. It's been a meaty one. We've talked about a lot of things. If you have questions, I want to encourage you to reach out, either leave a comment where you're listening to this or send us an email. We always love to hear from you and we love digging into this stuff. We just can't help it. If you're looking for more resources that dig into the details, check the show notes. There'll be a link to our agency profitability toolkit, which will help you learn more about the broader framework that utilization fits into. And we'll have some of the other resources that I mentioned in the episode as well. And with all of that, I want to thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the episode and I'll see you in the next one.